yes sir i am not able to hear you i think you are muted sir kindly unmute okay that's good can you hear me now <laughs> yes sir thank you so much again once again it's a honor uh, we are only feeling bad that you are not here physically with us yeah but it's so okay. nice it's so nice of you to join today today is the um, final day of our uh, four day congress we had a lot of sessions a lot of uh, uh, the dignitaries now we are again blessed to have you also so nice of you oh well, thank you so, so uh, time now here is people are joining only 8:22 8:30 is the time we set so another eight, uh, seven eight minutes will um, go live sir if that is okay, okay. okay so i have a half hour uh yes sir half half an hour um, okay. uh, for the lecture and then another 15 minutes for discussion so okay uh, professor Good. binu nainan uh, another neonatologist from uh, uh, india from southern india chennai will be the moderator for the session you will Great. see him when he joins sir and then okay. uh, uh, dr minu we want to come i'll just uh, he is here but we are not gone live live the stage is sure think sure. people are joining the... good morning good morning Oh, good good evening good morning <laughs> yeah it is evening there yeah. rather we should say night isn't it sir yes uh, good evening yeah. what time is it there sir it's uh almost 11 o'clock oh my god i am so night, sorry yeah. i've since the apologies <laughs> to keep no you no problem no problem <laughs> like because if you keep it at uh, other time you no know, like people will not join no? we want uh, yeah. this is a time in india like sure sure also peter davis is here and uh, he was uh, well, like uh, he, he, he was he was in person here actually so see oh, wow. uh, probably if he joins and in between after the session i will uh, uh, like uh, <laughs> turn the camera to him i don't know there okay. is another, another session that's a record the professor alan jobs talk is there at 9 o'clock after this okay. immediately after this so i don't know where he'll be this at that time i think so yeah, yeah. Uh, we are having is there a way Is there a way I can test the screen to make sure that my PowerPoint Yes, sir. Is... I will tell I will hand over to my technical team and then we will okay. we'll start testing right away sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much once again. I'll write you sir after the Very session. welcome. Okay. Thank you. Just uh, we'll put it live and see. Yeah. No, he wants to share it. Ah yeah. No. So you want to share the screen sir? Please. Yeah, I just want yeah. to make sure that it works. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead sir. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. It's working perfectly. Good. Good. Okay. Very good. Good morning. Good morning everyone. Good morning, Dr. Joseph New. Morning. And, and it's a, indeed a great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. New this morning for this talk on controversies in the nutrition of ELBW patient and babies. Dr. New is professor, Department of Pediatrics, Division of Neonatology. He received his bachelor's and arts degree in 1971 at Wisconsin State University. and completed his pediatric residency at John Hopkins Hall Hospital Baltimore MD from 1975 to 1978 and 1978 to 1980 did a post doctoral fellow in neonatology from the Stanford University in 1987 he completed a sabbatical from Switzerland Dr New has received during his career several honors and awards he chairs and is involved on national and international committees dr new is active on several societal memberships editorial boards journal reviewer service to the community service to schools he is well known for his lectures here and abroad dr new has received many appointments as assistant professor director division of neonatology associate professor a huge list i think probably at this stage he is now currently the uh, director of the neonatal intensive care unit at the university of florida 
His interest in teaching and research is in nutrition and the GI environment. It is indeed a great pleasure to welcome him to this uh, morning conference, and we are looking forward for the next 30 minutes for his lecture on the controversies in the nutrition of ELBW babies. At the end of 30 minutes, we will have a 15 minutes for discussion and any clarifications you would like. Dr. New, you could probably start now. I'd like to start with thank you, uh, thanking everybody for this uh, very kind introduction and uh, also for inviting me to this, uh, this conference. Unfortunately, uh, we can't be there in uh, person. Uh, I think that uh, you have done a wonderful job in terms of uh, uh, putting together this, this uh, uh, exciting four-day conference. And uh, I, I'm just uh, very pleased that, uh, that you're able to, uh, to, to accomplish this very challenging task. So let me just uh, see if we can, you can see my screen, right? Okay, so I'll be talking in the next half hour about some controversies in nutrition of the extremely low birth weight infant. Uh, this is a topic that is very broad and uh, uh, I, I think it's very difficult to do justice to this area in uh, just one half hour. But uh, I will try to pick out some areas that I think are of, uh, of major interest to many of us and uh, we'll just uh, uh, focus on some of those areas. So. Let's start here, and here's a picture of a 27-week uh, preterm baby. And the question is, how do we nourish this baby? And the agenda for the next 30 minutes will be, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the nutritional emergency. Uh, of sorry to interrupt, Dr. New, but yes. the, slides, the slides are not seen. Oh, the slides are not seen. Okay, because I see them here. Let me... Um... Okay. okay, let's go ahead with starting screen again. And yeah, slide now we can show. see, yes, we can see the screen now. Yes, we can. Beginning. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you can go ahead now. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, let's make sure that we are seeing the same screen. Yeah, this is a uh, for. Yeah, this is our a growth chart that you're showing now. Yes, okay. Okay, so here is the, um, the agenda for today. I, I will talk a little about the uh, nutritional emergency of the low birth weight preterm infants. Uh, the, talk about the, some of the consequences of early undernutrition. And then I'm going to focus on some of the controversies. And uh, these will include uh, intravenous lipids, uh, then enteral feeding, how much and how much advancement, uh, holding feedings during endomethacin and therapeutic uh, hypothermia, checking gastric residuals. And then also I want to talk a little bit about personalized nutrition and where we are going in the future. So here's a, a typical growth chart and a picture of uh, Richard Ehrenkrantz, a uh, uh, colleague uh, at Yale University that uh, I had worked with in uh, the area of neonatal nutrition. And he uh, devised this uh, uh, growth curve where we see the uh, uh, fetal growth from the 10th week, uh, uh, from babies that are in the uh, uh, 10th percentile and percentile uh, for fetal growth. But both babies who are born before 25 weeks, 26, 27 weeks, and 28, 29 weeks, you can see that these babies lag behind. And this is very unfortunate uh, because this is frequently associated with some real problems uh, uh, after uh, uh, the babies uh, uh, get out of the neonatal intensive care unit, as well as having some problems within the neonatal intensive care unit. We see numerous adverse effects associated with poor growth. Now, when we talk about fetal nutrition, uh, we see that these babies uh, uh, in utero have a continuous supply of glucose. Protein is taken up at around four grams per kilogram per day and lipids at three grams per kilogram per day. When the baby is born preterm, uh, this is interrupted. 
And th this could be highly problematic. This interruption could be highly problematic. Why? Well, here we look at uh, what a, uh, a fetus looks like in utero in terms of body composition and energy stores. So here's 24 weeks gestation, 26, 28, and 40 weeks gestation. And here we see the weight, the water composition, protein, lipid, and energy store. So a baby that's born between 24 and 26 weeks gestation has very low energy stores. This kind of an energy store, 123 calories per kilo per day, is what this baby needs in one day for survival. If the baby does not get this energy, what begins to happen is that this baby begins to utilize protein from uh, its, uh, its own body in terms of uh, proteolysis, in terms of energy, to, to, to be able to produce energy. And that will not last long. So this is a, a, a real problem in these very low birth weight infants. And we have to consider this a, a, uh, an emergency, just like we do many other emergencies, short birth. So what are the requirements in most of our pre babies? There are 100 kilograms per day growth if the baby is fed enterally. If the baby is on total parental nutrition, we can attain positive nutrition balance, 60 calories per kilogram a day, with about 0.5 grams per kilogram per day of protein. Minimal caloric intake for weight gain is about 80 calories per kilogram per day if on TPN. So this is important to remember that TPN and enteral nutrition require different caloric takes, but they are still highly significant and highly uh, uh, important in terms of uh, 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 this baby's uh, uh, survival and uh, 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 subsequent outcome. Now, when we think about this in terms of how much energy this little preterm baby is getting in terms of uh, 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 what the adult would be getting, if this baby is requiring 120 calories per kilogram per day, this equates to this guy here who is doing the Tour de France. The Tour de France cyclist is getting about 7,000 calories per kilogram per day. If you assume that he weighs 60 kilograms and is getting 120 kilo, uh, calories per kilogram per day, that is similar to the requirement for this very low birth weight baby. So what happens at 18 months if uh, you have uh, a retrospective study of babies that uh, uh, may have been uh, undernourished? So here is a slide that shows the first weak amino acid intake. And this is the uh, mental development index at 18 months. So during the first week after birth, for every one gram per kilo per day of protein increment, these babies get an 8.2 point increment in mental development index. When it comes to energy, for every 10 calories per kilogram per day at 18 months, there's about a 4.6 increment in the MDI, mental development index at 18 months. So during this first week after birth, you can see that there is a major effect on energy and protein. Now, what are some of the uh, uh, problems that we have with lipid intake? Well, if a baby is getting total parenteral nutrition, Classically, there's been major concern about hyperbilirubinemia, sepsis, pulmonary hypertension, lung disease, liver disease, and thrombocytopenia associated with lipid intake. All of these have been shown not to be uh, based on evidence. And so 
I think that we need to get away from some of these uh, uh, excuses that we use to withhold lipids early on. What happens when we withhold lipids to babies? Well, this is uh, uh, very problematic. Uh, we need to provide around 2.5 to 3 grams per kilogram per day to try to match the in utero supply of lipid, as I mentioned before. We have essential fatty acid deficiency that occurs very rapidly if we provide lipid-free nutrition to these babies. And we also have to be giving them long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids because many of these babies are not able to synthesize these long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids from the shorter essential fatty acids. And these long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids are very important in brain and retinal development. And lipids are also very important in producing energy. And if you provide enough energy, you can prevent catabolism and spare protein. Now, what about the essential fatty acids? There are two essential fatty acids. One is linoleic acid and the other is linolenic acid. The linoleic acid is an omega-6 fatty acid. And this is precursor to arachidonic acid, a C20 fatty acid. Very important for growth. Linolenic acid is also an 18 carbon uh, fatty acid. Uh, that uh, uh, is an omega-3, and uh, this desaturates and elongates to a 20 to 24 carbon fatty acid. Uh, the uh, 22 uh, uh, carbon fatty acid is called DHA or docosahexaenoic acid, also very important in terms of brain development. Efficiency of these two essential fatty acids occurs very rapidly. And in 80% of preterms, it will occur after less than one week of lipid-free nutrition. And here at the right, we see what, the, uh, 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 what it looks like when these babies get uh, the dermatitis associated with essential fatty acid deficiencies. And just imagine what is going on in the brain of these babies when they are not receiving these fatty acids. Now, lipid is a very important source of energy. And as I mentioned before, if a baby is on TPN, that baby needs 80 calories per kilogram per day for growth. And if a baby is getting eight milligrams per kilogram per minute of glucose, that will supply 39 calories. And if that same baby is getting three grams per kilogram per day of uh, amino acid, that will supply an additional 12 calories. But this baby still needs around 30 calories for 80 total. So that calculates to about three grams per kilo per day. And this is what we recommend starting in terms of lipids very early and after birth. There have been dogmas that we have uh, been concerned about giving this quantity of lipid, uh, the three grams per kilogram per day in the first day after birth, but there is no evidence to support that it is uh, uh, disadvantageous for the baby to do so. And we uh, think that uh, uh, to provide this kind of energy is uh, certainly going to be advantageous for the baby. Now, here's a controversy. When to start lipids? And what about monitoring lipids? There are many neonates, neonatologists who will monitor triglyceride levels uh, on a daily, every other day basis uh, uh, very frequently. And that takes a lot of blood to monitor triglyceride levels. But we have found that prolonged infusions of uh, lipids are safe. If we give them at less than 0.2 grams per kilogram per hour, it is unusual to see hypertriglyceridemia, although some extremely small babies may develop 
hypertriglyceridemia, the harm that that will do is very well, uh, is, is not very well substantiated. We do not have good norms for monitoring triglycerides. Uh, there are different norms that are recommended in different textbooks, but none of these are evidence-based. And so because of this, many of us, including uh, uh, me and our, and our neonatal intensive care units, care unit at the University of Florida have stopped uh, doing routine measurements of triglycerides in our very low birth weight babies. Now, what about enteral feedings? We have many excuses to withhold enteral feedings. And why do we have these excuses? We are all very concerned that we are gonna cause necrotizing enterocolitis. So traditionally, we've withheld enteral feedings in babies with low APGAR scores, babies who get, have umbilical catheters, who have apnea and bradycardia, who are receiving mechanical ventilation, CPAP or vasoactive drugs. And we have this concept that TPN is available and we can just uh, nourish babies with TPN for, for long periods of time. But this is problematic. And again, none of these excuses to withhold enteral feedings are evidence-based. Now, here's a picture of a, a lady from uh, the UK. This is Dr. Elsie Widowson. And around 60 years ago, she did some very important studies on piglets, where she found that in the first 24 hours after birth, the suckled pig's duodenum gains about 42% of its weight this is what is called a trophic effect of enteral feeding. If you do not enterally feed a piglet like this, the intestine does not gain weight. This has been seen in numerous studies in animals that you have to provide enteral nutrition for this trophic effect to occur. Parenteral nutrition will not provide this. In the mid-1980s, uh, Dr. Alan Lucas and colleagues did some work looking at the uh, uh, plasma gastrointestinal hormones in premature infants. And he looked at five different uh, gastrointestinal hormones, enteroglucagon, gastrin, uh, GIP, modulin, and neurotensin. And at birth, we see this level of these uh, hormones. At six days, if the baby is not fed at six days, these hormones do not rise. If the baby is fed and is well, you can see that at six days, these hormones rise dramatically. And even if the baby has respiratory distress syndrome, these hormones rise very significantly. So in order to uh, have this hormonal response, which is important for gut motility, for uh, uh, breaking down uh, various uh, 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 nutrients in the gastrointestinal tract uh, for uh, insulin production, it's very important that we put some food into the gastrointestinal tract. What happens to the liver if food is not provided and just parenteral nutrition is given? Well, here on the left, we see a liver after seven days of enteral nutrition. And on the right, we see a liver after seven days of TPN. And you can see just grossly looking at the liver that the uh, uh, TPN liver is very pale compared to the uh, enterally nourished liver. And on H&E stain, you see a ballooning of the hepatocytes and you see fat staining in the uh, uh, liver that is getting parenteral nutrition and also glycogen staining. So we are actually harming the liver by not providing enteral nutrition. This is a slide that shows uh, what happens to the gut permeability at uh, 15 days after birth if food is not provided in the gastrointestinal tract of preterm babies. And this uh, study was done uh, in the late 1990s uh, by Dr. Zell Shulman and Chandler. And what they did in this study 
was they had two groups of babies. One group of babies, uh, one group was getting uh, gastrointestinal priming, so small amounts of feeding in the gastrointestinal tract. And the other group was getting total parenteral nutrition to day 15. And they provided these babies with uh, uh, lactulose and mannitol. And they measured the lactulose and mannitol as permeability markers in the bloodstream of these babies. And here we see in the blue, those babies who were getting TPN. And here in the gray, we see the babies that were getting GI priming. So the permeability was much higher in the babies who were getting TPN. And this means that the junctions between epithelial cells were more open in those babies who were getting only TPN and having no food in their gastrointestinal tract. And this could potentially lead to uh, a higher permeability and uh, uh, mucosal antigens getting through to a highly um, uh, inflammatory submucosa that can cause intestinal inflammation. So having food in the gastrointestinal tract can actually decrease intestinal inflammation. And here's a study that seems to support that. This is a study that was done by Dr. Liza Konakova at Harvard University uh, and published about six, seven years ago. And they had two groups that they evaluated observationally retrospectively. One group was fed early prior to four days enterally, and the other group was fed after four days. And here we see some of the adverse outcomes in the early fed group compared to the late fed group. The late fed group had significantly higher adverse outcomes such as retinopathy of prematurity, chronic lung disease, periventricular leukomalacia. And at two weeks after birth, this late fed group also had higher interleukin-8 and other pro-inflammatory mediators in the bloodstream, suggesting that the uh, 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 early feeding prevented the inflammatory response in these babies. What about rate of enteral nutrition advancement? This is a study that was just published a couple of years ago uh, uh, from the UK in the New England Journal of Medicine. And the title of this paper was Controlled Trial of Two Incremental Milk Feeding Rates in Preterm Infants. One of the incremental rates was 18 cc's per kilo per day, and the other was 30 cc's per kilo per day. And what they showed in this study was that there was no significant difference in survival of these two groups and no significant difference in terms of sepsis or uh, advertising enterocolitis in these two groups of babies, despite one having a very uh, aggressive rate of uh, enteral feeding increase. But here's some further controversies. And I just want to ask you some question here, some questions here. Do you keep feeding if you are giving in the meth for ductus arteriosus? Do you keep feeding if you're giving in the methicin for IVH prophylaxis? What about hypothermia for hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy? Do you routine, routinely check gastric residuals? Do you routinely use suppositories in these preterm babies? Let's start out with this concept. This was a study that was done at Baylor University in the early uh, 2000s. And what they did in this was they looked at a piglet superior mesenteric artery blood flow during two epochs. One was an epoch where the babies were, uh, where these animals were getting enteral nutrition, another where they were getting TPN. And here you can see the superior mesenteric artery blood flow was considerably higher when these babies were getting enteral nutrition compared to when they were getting TPN. Now, what is the concern with giving enmethacin to these preterm babies? Well, the concern that we hear the most is that it causes vasoconstriction. Well, here we're seeing that lack of feeding and TPN is actually causing mesenteric vasoconstriction. So you can actually make the situation worse by 
not feeding the baby and giving the endomethacin. So most neonatal intensive care units have gone away from this, especially after this study that was done by Kleiman and colleagues. Uh, and this is a multi-center study. And the title of this was Enteral Feeding During Endomethacin and Ibuprofen Treatment of a Patent Ductus Arteriosus. What this study showed was that uh, uh, infants required less time to reach feeding volume endpoint if they were given trophic enteral feedings when they received endomethacin or ibuprofen treatment. And again, giving feedings during endomethacin or ibuprofen treatment did not result in increased necrotizing enterocolitis in these babies. What about feeding during hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and uh, uh, therapeutic hypothermia? Well, several years ago, it was dogma not to feed these babies enterally for those three days when these babies were getting hypoxic, uh, when they were getting uh, hypothermia for hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Well, practices were different in different countries. And in Scandinavia, they fed these babies. And in the UK, they did not feeding, feed these babies. And a paper was written it, looking at comparisons, and this was a paper in After Pediatric Scandinavia in 2015, showing that really there were no differences in terms of uh, 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 inflammatory responses or uh, necrotizing enterocolitis if these babies were actually being fed. We did a study at the University of Florida, and the, this was published in Neonatology in 2018. And the title of this was Enteral Feeding as an Adjunct to Hypothermia in Neonates with Hypoxic Ischemic Encephalopathy. And the results are seen on this slide. Minimal enteral nutrition subjects, this was during uh, hypothermia for HIE, these uh, infants had a reduced length of hospital stay. Minimal enteral nutrition was associated with less days receiving parenteral nutrition and time to full or, uh, oral feedings. Minimal enteral nutrition was associated with a significantly reduced serum IL-12 at 24 and 96 hours. So we saw a decreased inflammatory response and the brain MRI scores were not significantly different between these groups. So we have uh, uh, started to uh, uh, routinely provide some at least minimal enteral nutrition to these uh, infants uh, during hypothermia. Here's the question. Here you have this uh, uh, little 27-week preterm baby that I showed you before, and you're on call at 2 o'clock in the morning. And the nurse reports that this baby was being fed 2 milliliters of breast milk every 3 hours, is having 2 cc gastric residuals. What do you do? Well, here's some options. Tell the nurse not to bother you at 2 a.m. Stop all feedings. Ask about the physical exam and perhaps examine the baby yourself. Those are some of the options that we had before. But the bigger question is, should we even be checking gastric residuals routinely? Well, we did a, retro, uh, we did a prospective randomized study, and this was published in uh, uh, JAMA Pediatrics uh, about three years ago. And the title of this paper was uh, Effect of Gastric Residual Evaluation on Enteral Intake in Extremely Preterm Infants. And again, this was prospective randomized in over 120 babies. And the conclusions and relevance in this study was that among extremely preterm infants, the omission of gastric residual evaluation increased the delivery of enteral nutrition, as well as improved weight gain and led to earlier hospital discharge. And these results may uh, translate into evidence-based practice. We also saw no difference in intestinal damage in the two groups that were getting the gastric residuals versus not getting the gastric residuals. What about routine meconium evacuation for facil facilitating feed tolerance in preterm neonates? Well, there have been several studies that have looked at this. And here's a... Uh, uh, meta-analysis that examined these studies. And the conclusion 
from this study was that uh, uh, the, there was very low quality evidence, but giving the uh, enemas or giving uh, 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 these uh, glycerin suppositories did not improve feeding tolerance in the few studies that are available. Now, in the future, we are going to be looking more at personalized nutrition. Why? Well, here we have two babies, a baby born at 23 weeks preterm pre and the other born at 29 weeks preterm. These are very different little human beings and their nutritional needs are very different. And we have to begin to think about the fact that one size does not fit all. And if we undernourish or overnourish some of these babies, we could be causing some potential problems. Here's some of these potential problems, neck, BPD, ROP, uh, late onset sepsis, growth failure. And overnutrition in a baby who's been undernourished may actually result in metabolic syndrome later on in life. So we need to have better uh, ways to provide personalized nutrition for these babies. We use a lot of growth curves. And here are some uh, examples of growth curves. And uh, one of the problems is, with growth curves is that if the baby begins to fall off the growth curve, it's probably already too late and damage has been done. So what we need to begin to think about is preemptively treating these babies? And how can we uh, use some of the technologies that are available now to uh, be able to provide precision nutrition for these babies so that they don't even have growth faltering and so that we don't uh, try to need, or so that we don't need to play catch up growth with these babies? Well, we are getting there. And with the use of artificial intelligence, and the use of uh, uh, analysis of the microbiome and multiomics, we are getting there. And here's a paper that was uh, published uh, just uh, a couple of months ago. And the title of this paper was uh, Integrating Longitudinal Clinical and Microbiome Data to Predict Growth Faltering in Preterm Infants. And in this study, uh, there were uh, uh, babies that were taken from um, uh, the uh, network from the uh, UK and also three neonatal intensive care units in the United States. And uh, they integrated uh, 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 data uh, from these different uh, neonatal intensive care units uh, and found features that were highly related uh, to the development of growth failure. And they also found that uh, integrating the microbiome data with certain taxa of microbes, you could predict growth faltering in these babies very early on. So this is one of the first papers using uh, multiomics and artificial intelligence to predict growth faltering. And I think that this will be very important in the future for personalized precision-based nutrition. And so I'd like to stop the lecture here with some take-home messages. Early nutrition in preterm babies can be safe and efficacious and may prevent significant morbidity. Growth is important, but we also need to consider long-term neurodevelopment and other health consequences. Many of the dogmas that have prevented rapid incorporation of early nutrition have either been disproved, not based on fact, or weak. Not all preterm infants are the same. In the future, we'll need to focus on a more personalized approach that accounts for a specific gestational age and degree of illness. And omic considerations such as the microbiome will be utilized for these predictive measures. I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions and I look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much, Professor New, for that uh, wonderful talk. Uh, just to summarize so, uh, for this talk, um, you started with uh, the importance of adequate calories, protein, and fat for a TPN, and that we should not be withholding lipids, start lipids on day one, because in no other way will you be able to maintain 
the adequacy of the calories. Then you went on to the enteral part of it and the importance of early feeding, uh, both from the point of view of growth, from the importance of feeding on the liver, and even that it reduces the risk of anesi and the points of no need for looking at residual feeds, no need for enemas, and to continue trophic feeds during intermedicine, ibuprofen, or even hypothermia. Thank you very much for all of that. Um, I leave the uh, discussion for the audience here. Is, do anybody want to ask a question? If anybody does, please stand up. They'll bring a mic to that. Um, while they ask, uh, can I ask you one question, please? Do you go for the aggressive uh, protein uh, on day one, starting at 3, 3.5, or would you start at something like 2 gram per kg per day? Uh, this is a little bit controversial, and uh, uh, I, I am starting at 3 to 4 grams per kilo per day. And uh, I think that uh, there are some uh, papers that suggest that, uh, that uh, there may be some metabolic imbalances uh, with uh, the use of uh, uh, 3.5 to 4 grams per kilo per day. But I think that uh, it's also important to provide adequate amino acids to these babies. And uh, uh, I think that in the future, we are going to hopefully be able to fine tune uh, the kind of amino acids that are present in the uh, uh, amino acid formulations for uh, providing more precision-based nutrition in the babies. But at this juncture, I think that uh, uh, my tendency is to uh, uh, give more amino acids to these babies, three to four grams per kilo per day, uh, especially in the smallest babies, because I think that those are the babies who need it the most. And if so, how much of lipid would you start on the day one? Three. Right. So three grams of lipid and three grams of uh, amino acid on day one, right? Yes. Any questions from the audience? When we are starting lipid at three gram per kg per day, in extremely low birth weight, baby is producing lipemic blood. So what should we do for that? So I think that uh, this is something that uh, you want to uh, uh, be a little bit careful about, okay? Because that lipemic blood may be not because uh, you are giving too much lipid, but because that baby is so highly stressed. And so we really do not know exactly the reason behind that uh, hypertriglyceridemia, but it could very well be because that baby is so highly stressed and still needs that energy and still needs those, uh, uh, um, uh, those essential lipids. So I, I would uh, at, the very le at the very most just decrease the lipid intake if you are concerned about the hypertriglyceridemia to about one gram per kilo per day, but I would not stop the lipids. Any other questions from anybody? Yes, thank one you. more question. Yeah. So thank you, Professor New, for the wonderful talk. So I have uh, three questions. If these extremely preterm babies are extremely low but weight babies, when they are on full enteral feeds, how should they grow? And what is our growth, what should be our growth target when they reach around 36 to 40 weeks? and uh, how that growth affects long-term outcome. And if poor growth is associated with long-term outcome, what are the nutritional interventions that we can do at around 34 to 36 to 40 weeks after that to improve the long-term outcome? Well, I think that uh, uh, at this juncture, we, we'd like to follow, have them follow the growth curves, okay? And the uh, growth curves that are standard for your region, there are, uh, I think that there are growth curves that are different in different parts of the world. And uh, I would uh, uh, use the growth curves that you have available to you and look at whether it's a boy or a girl, okay? I, I think that uh, uh, boys and girls grow differently. And there are certainly uh, uh, sex-related differences that we have to pay attention to. Um, in general, 
the uh, uh, growth that we like to see is somewhere between around 15 to 20 grams per kilo per day. And certainly if, if you, uh, I think that uh, uh, poor growth may be associated with uh, 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 poor outcomes at a later point in time. Now, I know that there are some studies and uh, Dr. Nina Modi has done some studies in the UK looking at certain of these babies. And so for example, if a baby is born IUGR, there is some evidence that pushing those babies too hard may be uh, problematic. And I, I agree with Dr. Modi that uh, uh, some of those babies, what you do is follow their Z curve, okay? And what you want to get is a Z, it's not a curve, it's just following their, uh, their, their own uh, Z score. Uh, and their Z score should be flat, not increasing, but flat. But we don't know at this juncture which babies we should really be doing that with. And uh, uh, I, I'm hoping that within the next few years, we are going to get a better precision-based approach so that we can look at each baby individually and say, this baby is going to require this kind of an approach. This one? Yeah, but you please go ahead. Hi, uh, just a couple of uh, questions regarding enteral feeding. Um, I think we all agree that human milk is better than formula in these, especially in these preterm babies. Do you all use banked human milk if the mother's milk is not available? And about fortification of feeds, uh, do you all use uh, prefer human milk fortifiers or do you prefer, I mean, do you use whatever is available? So good questions. Uh, we... Uh, most of the neonatal ICUs in the in the U.S. Uh, use the uh, follow the American Academy of Pediatric Guidelines, and that is that those babies that are less than fifteen hundred grams uh, get human milk until they're about fifteen hundred grams. Okay. Now, uh, in terms of whether donor milk actually provides a benefit in, with, uh, in all of these babies can be argued. And the reason I say that is that uh, if you look closely at some of the studies, I think sometimes we use donor milk and that we sometimes do not adequately fortify that uh, uh, donor human milk. Donor human milk is uh, for these uh, very tiny babies is uh, uh, from a protein perspective, uh, from the, the various different perspectives is not adequate for these very low birth weight babies. You don't give them enough calcium. You don't give them enough phosphorus. So they do have to be fortified. What kind of fortification is the best? There are uh, some studies that suggest that uh, uh, the human milk, that, that the uh, uh, things like the uh, prolacta may be uh, 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 better than uh, giving uh, a cow's milk based fortifiers. I am not convinced that those studies are as uh, rigorous as they should be. And there are studies that are ongoing right now that are not supported by the companies that uh, uh, may tell us those results. Uh, but at this juncture, I am not convinced that uh, uh, those human-based fortifiers are necessarily uh, better than the cow, cows-based fortifiers. Uh, but there are some retrospective, uh, some uh, uh, small prospective studies that suggest that they may be, but none of them is uh, powered for looking at necrotizing enterocolitis with 1,500 or so babies, which is what is required in an adequately uh, uh, powered prospective randomized study. Thank you. Uh, there's a question, online question. If a mother is producing milk um, a lot, can they grade up a feeds faster than the 30 ml? You said there's a comparison between 18 and 30 ml per kg per day. Can we increase it even faster, say 40 or 45 ml? Is there any, anything wrong with that? 
I think you have to look at each baby individually <clears throat> with that. And I know of uh, some of my uh, colleagues in India uh, who have been doing that uh, at a much faster rate, <clears throat> you know, at 40 and 45. And uh, I think that if, uh, if it works for a particular baby, uh, I, I, I don't have a problem with that. Uh, I, I have seen you know, studies that uh, suggest that it does work. And there are some pioneering studies done, being done in uh, New Delhi that uh, uh, I think have, uh, have shown that that is possible. So I, I'm not going to argue that point. I, I think it is possible in, in certain individual babies. Any, any other question? No. Okay, the... Sir, I have. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, we all understand mother's own milk is the best. But in case we are not able to do that, uh, do you recommend for a separate preterm donor human milk banking? Uh, uh, is it okay to feed the preterms with uh, term? And if we are going to bank only on preterm human milk, uh, the increased protein content of the preterm milk, is it okay? Uh, will that not be producing some feed intolerance? What's your opinion on that? Because even using uh, donor milk, we are encountering feed intolerance a lot. Yeah, I, I think that, that that is a, a very common finding that uh, uh, even with human milk, uh, uh, donor milk, that, uh, that uh, a lot of our smaller babies do have feeding intolerance. And uh, you have to be uh, cognizant, especially in those babies who are getting uh, uh, non-invasive mechanical ventilation, uh, uh, you know, with nasal prongs, uh, a lot of those babies have abdominal distension. You have to tr make sure that you are uh, decompressing those babies uh, uh, in terms of air in their bowel. Uh, so I, I think one of the questions that, that you were getting at is, should we be using preterm donor milk? Should and we have a separate banking for that? Do you suggest I, that? I do not suggest that. I do not suggest that. I, I think that that uh, adds a level of complexity, which is very, very high. And I'm not sure if you're going to get the benefit uh, by using a, a preterm donor milk. Thank I, you. You know, yeah. Do you have any more time? Anyone? We can go ahead. Okay. So I think we've got time. If you are okay with that, we can keep asking questions. Sure. Uh, See, one of the problems in India is that donor milk is available in certain setups, but not everywhere. And there are these companies which market um, packed uh, donor milk, which is extremely expensive. So if I start uh, a preterm baby or ELBW baby on donor milk, how long do I need to continue with the donor milk? If the mother is not able to produce her own milk, say, should I continue for a week or two weeks or three weeks? How long do I do that? And when can I go to a standard preterm formula? Okay, so uh, the uh, guidelines, the European guidelines and the uh, uh, American Academy of Pediatric Guidelines, uh, they uh, focus at around 32 weeks to 34 weeks uh, uh, corrected gestational age, okay? So I think that that is what is, recommended by the uh, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics and also the, the European um, uh, nutritional guidelines. But in terms of the, the uh, use of uh, uh, the, the, the donor milk, my question to you is, when you look at the literature really closely, how convincing is it that donor milk actually is that advantageous for the prevention of necrotizing enterocolitis. That is the reason it's usually given that it prevents necrotizing enterocolitis. But those are all retrospective studies. And the retrospective observational studies are, uh, th those are associations. They are not, uh, done in a, uh, uh, in a way that we have a really rigorous way to looking at uh, whether uh, necrotizing enterocolitis is actually prevented by the use of donor milk. 
So it may be that some of these babies uh, uh, are having less feeding intolerance. And with less feeding intolerance with the use of uh, 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 donor human milk, we are doing less radiographs, doing less radiographs that uh, uh, show these uh, uh, findings that could be suggestive of, an, uh, of pneumatosis intestinalis, but we see so many radiographs where the radiologists say suggestive of pneumatosis intestinalis, and then we write that the baby has necrotizing enterocolitis in the chart. So I think that we need to uh, uh, take a step back and ask, what is the definition of necrotizing enterocolitis? Uh, how do we actually diagnose this? And we need to, uh, to come up with uh, uh, better definitions of these uh, intestinal injuries that we see in babies. And you know, necrotizing enterocolitis, I think, is not really a discrete disease. It's a diagnosis that uh, encompasses several different uh, uh, entities. So it, even though we are making some progress in these areas, I think that uh, uh, we are not making enough progress. And one of the reasons is because we have this uh, uh, diagnosis of necrotizing enterocolitis, which is extremely diffuse and not well-defined. Thank you very much. I think we are run out of time. That was a wonderful talk and thank you for answering so patiently.